All right, guys, how y'all doing this evening? This is Nick, the Nutter Buster, here to kind of give you a full rundown, or as full a rundown as I can with my scattered little brain. I'm going to try to go over everything uh, in my saddle setup. Uh, I've got a lot of questions about it. I've posted some pictures, some videos. I've uh, had some threads on the way to get to that point. And I've had a lot of, a lot of people help me out along the way can't take credit for all the good ideas, but I've, I've been saddle hunting for about three years now. Um, I've learned a lot and my setup has progressed very rapidly. Um, it's kind of gone some directions that I didn't necessarily think it would have gone. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like at this point I've, I've kind of nailed down what I personally like in a saddle system. Um, I feel like I've kind of along the way talked with some people that hunted in, in some different methods. Um, kind of got a deeper understanding of why I have it set up the way I have it set up. Um, and I'm going to just try to go ahead and explain um, the setup as fully as I can since I get a lot of questions about it. Try to go over it piece by piece and explain how it works because it works as a unit. Um, I think that's very important. A lot of people get tied up in this aspect or this aspect. And it's very important to me that all of my gear kind of functions as one cohesive unit. Um, so there's little changes that I make with my gear that may not make sense to somebody else because they don't necessarily have, you know, another component of their gear set up that way. So like the way that my pack is set up, it kind of interacts with my gear, the way that my gear hoist is set up, the way that my steps are set up, the way that I carry stuff. Um, I have it all set up in a very particular way. So I'm hoping that maybe some of you new guys looking at this will kind of Kind of start taking a bigger picture of that and seeing how everything integrates. Um, I do place a pretty high premium on a weight um, and then even more than that on packability. Because packability is what really gets you. Um, you know, you, you have to carry all this stuff in through the woods, thick, nasty brush where whitetails live. Um, you know, and if you're carrying in big, heavy, bulky climbers, you know, that's what we're all trying to get away from, get to something that's lighter and more compact and easier to get through the woods. Um, that's big. And then another thing for me that I'm very big on is, um, you know, safety and simplicity. So I like gear that's very easy to use. Um, even if it's dark and it's cold, I like simple motions, um, repetitive motions, stuff that it's easy to do over and over and over and over again and just kind of ingrain into your muscle memory. Um, you know, any, any time that I can remove a piece of gear, simplify, make one piece of gear do the work of two, I'll do that. Um, so we're just going to kind of go over it. This is going to be a probably a pretty long video. I've got a little something to wet my whistle. An old lady is out of town as much as I like to uh, give her a hard time. Me and her kind of grew up together. I've known her my whole life and uh, it's mighty, mighty quiet in my little squirrel nest here on the river without her here. So I figured I'd go ahead and since I got a little peace and quiet and don't know what to do with myself for the next hour or two before I go to bed, I figured I'd go ahead and put this video together. So we'll kind of dive into it. We'll start. I'm actually not going to start with the saddle. We're going to kind of start with the pack, all right, because I feel like the pack is a very big part of your system. Um, even though for me, I don't really carry any of my actual saddle gear in my pack. I've kind of moved away from that. Um, this is a Badlands Silent Reaper, I believe. Um, it's made out of a mutex fabric. It's kind of a fleece backpack. It doesn't have any type of internal frame. You can see it's a very small pack. Um, I'm blessed here in the Deep South that we don't have a lot of cold days. So it's not necessary that I carry a whole lot of layering clothes and stuff like that when I do. Like this past weekend, it was 24 degrees, which is pretty cool for here. Um, it does have straps where you can strap stuff to the bottom of it. But usually this main compartment on a hunt, all that it carries, <clears throat> top flips open, which is nice when you're up in a tree. You just flip it open. It's held by magnets up here. It's very quiet. All that it usually holds is a jacket. This is actually a Browning Shacket. Very good piece of gear if you can find one. Um, it's insulated in the core. It's got primal loft insulation. It doesn't have anything in the sleeve, so it's an excellent bow hunting or warmer weather jacket. Because you get insulation in your core where it counts, but you're not, you know, putting bulk on your arms. Um, I've also got, because it was cold, I got some gloves. 
just fingerless mittens. Usually I do not wear gloves. I don't care for them. Um, I like I like to have full use of my fingers and down here it just doesn't get cold enough to necessitate them. But I've got these accessory pockets. These really carry all of my gear. Um, so that's very simple. This big pocket, you got a big pocket and a little pocket. Now this little pocket and this little Ziploc bag, that's my licenses, which is a necessity. Doesn't, nothing you can really do about that. You gotta carry your licenses. Um, Black Diamond headlamp. I go through one of these about every two seasons. They eventually give up the ghost. They get wet, they quit working. Uh, even the ones that say that they're waterproof, they're really not. Uh, compass, and uh, this is actually just a little Silva starter compass. Um, I prefer the cheap compasses as opposed to a big lensatic compass because in the eastern whitetail woods, I don't feel like you're doing a lot of cross-country navigation. My dad was Corps engineers. He did a lot of stuff like that. That doesn't really come up. You're hunting, you know, smaller parcels of land, you're never really that far off a road or a river or a ditch or some sort of identifying marker. Your compass is mainly just to get you, you know, maybe a mile or two tops through the woods. So an orienteering, you know, navigation compass is just not that practical. I like something that's lightweight, unobtrusive, relatively accurate, and I like something that settles on north quickly because sometimes you get in this thick brush and it's very easy sometimes just as little as 20 or 30 yards you can get turned around in the palmettas in the brush down here and you can get off course. I have spent nights in the woods walking circles and that's a bad, bad feeling. Um, you know, you'd just be out there in a swamp, maybe you're in knee deep water, it's flooded, you're trying to go from the high ground to get back to your kayak and I, I tell you it's just a mighty, mighty bad feeling when you realize that you've come circles or you've been walking for a half a mile and you should have made it to the boat in a quarter of a mile. Uh, so I always, always keep a compass with me. Um, now, just here in this past season, I have moved to, that is a backup compass. My primary compass is actually mounted to my pack. It's mounted on the strap. I don't know if you can see it, but that's a ball compass. Uh, ball compasses are awesome. I have one of them now on my pack. So when I'm walking, it's very easy, like I said, sometimes you want to check your bearings very frequently because it's easy to get off course. So that's just right there. I can glance down and I can tell you like right now I'm facing south. Um, at any point I can check down and get a quick compass bearing. If this were to come off, I have a backup that's securely in my pack, so I'm not going to lose it. Um, that's very important to me personally. If you're hunting smaller parcels of land, or if you don't hunt that far off of a road, or if you... Uh, like if I'm on my lease or a piece of public ground that I know very well, I may not check my compass as often, but I always have it with me. Um, I do not do a lot of navigation without that, without that compass. I don't go in the woods without one. It's just not worth the risk. Um, the area that I hunt it is a fairly wild tract of land, and there are fatalities pretty much every year, actually. Uh, my wife's uncle and cousin uh, just, just recently passed away on a uh, mullet skip. Uh, they still don't quite know what happened to them, but both of them had spent a lifetime in the commercial fishing industry. Um, and, you know, one of them was 80 years old and had been fishing since he started with his daddy as a boy. Um, over 100 years of experience on the water between the two of them. Stuff happens a few years back. Uh, there were some kids who got killed in a river crossing. They were trying to Squirrel Hunter Island that I've been to dozens if not hundreds of times. Uh, they crossed in a canoe, which I've done dozens if not hundreds of times, and they just did it on the wrong day. When the wind gets up above about the 10 mile an hour mark, that river's just too wide, and there's, there's too much wind on it, it starts white capping, there's a real bad current, and it's very, very dangerous for small boats. On a regular day, it's slick as glass, but it gets bad very, very quick and without warning. Um, people get lost. Uh, one of the tracks of public land that I hunted a lot when I was in college. It's actually right there outside of an industrial complex and it's got a police department luckily right there about a quarter of a mile away. And uh, there was a gentleman who got lost, turned around, like I was saying, he was just walking circles in the Palmettas. And uh, the railroad tracks come by and they kind of make a U. 
So he kept trying to follow the sign of the train tracks, but the problem is there was trains to the north and trains to the south, so he could never really figure out which way it was. If he'd have had a compass, he'd made it out the woods in an hour, and as it was, he spent most of the night. And, uh, you know, he was okay, but he definitely scared his family and friends, and that's not something you ever want to do. So I apologize for talking so long about that, but that's just a very important uh, part of the way I operate. I always have my compass on me, and then I always have uh, my phone, which I'm filming with right now on my phone. Obviously, it's great for taking pictures when you're lucky enough to kill something. And I also run Hunt Stand and Onyx on it. Uh, I do use Google Earth on it occasionally. There's some different apps that I find very useful, and it does have a pretty capable GPS. Um, I quit carrying a handheld GPS years ago just because it was just another piece of gear, and it finally got to the point where the technology in my phone that I always had in my pocket was good enough for government work, so to speak, and I quit carrying it. So, um, I don't have my full kill kit in here. I usually keep a pair of um, disposable latex or nitrile gloves and a Havilon and a trash bag, and that's about it. That's my kill kit. Um, I cut all my deer up Womack style. Uh, started doing that. Uh, not before Mr. Womack. I'm not old enough to have thought of anything before Mr. Womack thought of it, but uh, kind of developed that idea independently uh, when I was hunting with my dad back in the day. I remember the first time we ever did that on a riverbank way back in the woods somewhere. And uh, it worked well, and I've kind of refined it. He never did. He always preferred, my father preferred to skin them out on a, on a skinning rack and uh, on a gamble. And to be honest, I've clean so many of them on the ground I just about don't know what to do if you hang one up. Uh, I'm, I'm always usually my first cuts that I make is to cut the quarters off then I'll take the back straps and here in the past season I've started experimenting with kind of trying to debone get a little extra a couple of pounds of meat off the neck so and then everything usually goes um, if it's an average size deer here believe it or not most of it's gonna fit in this pack. If I take that jacket out and I strap it to the bottom you can get both shoulders and both back straps in here. Sling your gun or your bow over your shoulder and you can walk out the woods with the hams in your hand. And uh, that's not bad at all to do. I have packed it out. I've, I've played with keeping a separate Alice pack and you just drop all your gear off to the truck and make another trip back there. But uh, if I'm hunting with two people, especially, or if I'm hunting less than a mile from the truck, it's easy to just make do with what you got and get it out. Um, Another thing I just noticed in the camera, you'll see here there's a magnet, and that'll come in handy later. Um, so we start putting my kill kit. I keep a small medicine bag. That's just some Advil and some Benadryl. Good for obvious stuff. I don't really carry a lot of food or water. If I'm on an all-day hunt, I'll carry food and water, but if I'm just going on a half-day hunt, unless it's very hot in the early season, then it's kind of a necessity that you carry water. It can be dangerous because we get 90 degree heats, um, and, and the humidity is just insanely high. You get off in the swamp, your low-lying area, you don't get any breeze. The vegetation is very thick. The air just gets very, very still. It gets very dangerously hot. Um, and in cases like that, I'll, I'll have a bottle of water or two in here. I'll have some back at the canoe or the truck if I'm going in uh, by canoe. I like to do that. Um, but that's really about all I usually keep in that. This backpack right now is empty. Um, you know, late season, I'll add some clothes. But that's, that's kind of my core right there is your licenses, your kill kit, your compass, my medicine bag, my headlamp. And I know that that's not a lot of gear. But, but everything else that just don't help me kill deer, so I don't carry it. Uh, down here, our buck to doe ratio is very, very skewed. Um, I've never had a lot of luck with scents or grunts. I don't use those. I'm not a gadget guy. Um, oh, I do have my gear hanger. Uh, that's a very important piece of gear that I almost forgot. Usually what I do is when I get to the truck, it lives in my backpack, so it's always there with my hunting stuff. When I get to the truck, I just take this and I'll tuck it in a sharp pocket or somewhere on my jacket but this is just some bent wire that's a hook hang my bow that's a hook to hang my pack now that's just a cam jam and 550 cord y'all seen it before it's very very light when you roll it all up it's very quick to set and ain't hardly big as a golf ball 
So that usually goes in my breast pocket if I'm walking in the dark. A lot of, a lot of times, all this gear is in my pockets and the pack is just there to carry clothes. Um, you'll notice that none of my saddle hunting stuff is in my pack. Um, I don't need a big pack because I'm not carrying sticks, I'm not carrying a climber, I'm not carrying camera arms, I don't sell film. Um, other feature on my pack, you do have to have something to carry your bow up the tree. I do not like fooling with pull-up ropes. I'm 100% a Doyle's hunting hoist guy. Um, I've got mine built into the pack so you can't see it. It actually runs out to a grommet. And then I've just got that little cord right there. All that I gotta do, if I walk in with my pack on my back, and I get to the base of my tree, all you gotta do is reach back there, grab it, and then I either clip that into the top cam of my bow, or I can clip it into my rifle fling and just set it down on the ground and start climbing. There's hardly any delay. There's no what I call fiddle factor. Um, I do not like to fiddle with stuff in the dark at the base of the tree. Once I get to a tree and I decide that's the tree I'm going to climb, I like to get going. I do not like to dilly-dally. Um, well, that's my pack. Um, there is a piece of gear that I can somehow mislaid. I, recent, I, I just washed this pack because I actually, the last time I, uh, I shot a deer this past weekend, and I didn't have my trash bag. I'd used up the last one hunting with a friend, helped him pack out a deer. There it is. I don't usually live there. But, uh, so I just threw, you know, back straps and shoulders in the pack without a trash bag, and it's not that big of a deal. You just get home and you wash it. A trash bag's really not that important. Um, but I may not carry one next year because doing that and as easy as it was to just throw the pack in the wash Why carry a trash bag and I know that sounds crazy uh, To some people to say oh, I'm gonna save weight and save the hassle of carrying a trash bag That's just how I operate. I mean if, if I could hunt barefoot in a long cloth I would just keep from carrying that with me uh, this lives in my pack as well. This is kind of bounced around several places. This is my easy cut drill. Y'all have seen it before if you've watched videos. That's it. Um, right now we're working with the tree hopper drill. Um, there's some little things I'm not crazy about with it. I think it's a very good product. I look forward to seeing it made into the perfect drill. Because um, I think it has the potential to be that. It's not there right now. Right now this is. This is just my silenced easy cut drill. This is drilled probably thousands of holes at this point. It's still going strong. Um, Usually, it rides in my pack. Sorry, my ice settled in my drinking reminded me it was there. Um, this rides in my pack. When I get to the truck and I'm getting my stuff ready, I take just a second and I'll go ahead and stick this in a cargo pocket somewhere so it's readily available when I decide to start climbing. So that's it. This is the infamous Nutter Buster Slum Kestrel. I, this is a dinosaur. Uh, I ordered this Kestrel when I got into saddle hunting. I went from a trophy line. Uh, then I found out, I found saddlehunter.com. Started learning about New Tribe, which was at the time the hot new thing on the market. It was before Tethered came out. Back in the dark days, two years ago. Um, so this was pre-ordered. I had to wait a fairly long time to get this in my hands. I was very happy. This is just a size one camouflage Kestrel. Um, that I have made some pretty substantial modifications to. You may not be familiar with this dump pouch. This dump pouch is new. Um, I just started adding this into the mix a few hunts ago, but I do like it very much. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit and talk about where I plan to go with a dump pouch in the future because I think I will kind of main a dump pouch for a while or some sort of pocket on the saddle. Uh, but everything that you see here, if you include this drill into the mix, five pounds, seven ounces. This is everything I need to get up the tree. If you add knee pounds, you still come in at just under six pounds. That opens up just a world of possibilities. This is my climbing method. Um, this is my lineman's belt. This is my tether. This is my, just, just everything. My ring of steps, everything fits in this nice little package. You can see, it ain't hardly big as a basketball. It's awesome. I've spent a lot of money. I've spent a lot of time. I've spent a lot of nights tweaking stuff. I've wasted money. Bought, sold gear, lost money on it to go buy new gear. And I'm going to go over this whole setup with you right here. So settle in, pour yourself another drink, we're going to keep rambling. Alright, so usually I put this thing on at the truck. I walk in with my saddle. I got a different buckle than what comes standard with it. That's just a buckle. 
just a two inch plastic buckle trader for like 350 pounds. It's nothing special, but it's a lot quieter. It's a lot lighter. It's a little bit simpler to operate. It's more pleasant when it is cold, which is not very often down here that the weather gets cold, but when it is cold, it's nice to uh, have something that's easier to touch. Um, you have steady burning your fingers on steel. Um, and it cinches a lot tighter than the steel buckle. I had forgotten, some people complain about their saddle riding down them, and if you're using the stock buckle that comes on those new tribe saddles, I think that's the reason. This buckle stays tight. This was made to go on a chest holster. That chest holster stayed very, very tight. This stays tight too. It's got a little bit of a radius to it, so it's very comfortable. I can wear this saddle all day. Never know it's there. Something I'll never understand is people that talk about not being able to wear a Kestrel and going to a Kite or a Mantis because it has the mesh and it's more comfortable. It is as, I can confidently say, it is as hot here in South Alabama as it is anywhere in the continental United States and probably anywhere in the world. We are very close to the equator. The delta that I hunt is a semi-tropical environment. Our season starts in September. It is H-O-T hot. It never cools down. And this quarter of fabric just does not bother me walking through the woods. It, it doesn't. I can't, I can't help you if it does. Um, I don't understand it. Maybe your butt sweats more than my butt. I don't know. We'll drink to that. Um, but I have cut, if you look, for a long time I had my lineman's loops uh, just kind of sewed in right here. I eventually cut them off. Because in three years, I never found myself in a situation where I wanted lineman's loops. Now, if you do this, I'm not a climbing professional. I'm not an arborist. I'm not a rock climber. I'm not OSHA certified. I'm just some country boy that lives on the river and likes to shoot deer. I don't have kids. I got a real good life insurance policy. My wife has a good job. She'll be fine if I die. She'll probably find somebody better looking, richer, and funnier anyway, so I ain't got nothing to lose. Um, so anything, if you modify any of your gear or you use any of, from here on out, you know, talking in the pack, none of that's going to get you hurt. The stuff that we're fixing to talk about here, if you do it and you get hurt, don't sue me. Uh, do it at your own risk. I'm not taking responsibility for your safety. I don't feel bad if you get hurt. I ain't got to, I ain't got to pay your bills. I ain't got to put your kids through college and I ain't really got to avoid awkward eye contact with your widow. So... Uh, be safe, use your common sense. Everything, that being said, obviously, everything I do here, I, I do want to come home at the end of every hunt. I have confidence in what I'm doing, but you have to make that judgment call for yourself. And I do just want to stress that if you're going to hunt off the ground, you need to take the time. And there's some, there some basic information that you need to understand. You need to run the risk evaluation. You need to make that call for yourself. You need to be educated. If you're not willing to do the research, to justify why you climb the way you climb. If you don't know the numbers on your gear, if you're not familiar with, you know, just, just some of the basic strengths of different materials, some different industry standards, like 23 kilonewtons gets thrown out there a lot as a basic rock climbing standard. I don't strictly adhere to it, and I understand why, because it's a lot of overkill even for the rock climbing industry. Uh, 23 kilonewton fall could very well kill you before it broke your carabiner. Just your body just can't handle that much energy. Um, so I'm willing to fudge. But you don't need to just take my word for it and say, oh, well, Nutter Buster said that I don't need a 23 kilonewton carabiner. Don't do that. Read for yourself. Go to multiple high-quality sources. Talk with people who are in that industry. And especially when you're new, when I first started, everything I had was overkill because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So I hunted out of a stock trophy line, which you could probably pull a tank with. Big old thick, heavy duty, two inch webbing on everything. I mean, just big heavy steel buckles and it was very, very safe feeling, which I needed because I didn't know what I was doing. I did not feel safe in a saddle the first dozen times I hunted in it. It felt like a big experiment that I didn't know that I would stick with. As I've gotten more comfortable, you pare your gear down. It's kind of like camping. First time you go camping, you take everything. Worked at a sporting goods store. You see people didn't ever camp before, and dude, they'd pack two vans full of stuff and have to leave stuff at the house because they couldn't fit it in the two van two vans. Uh, me and my buddies go camping. We'll share a backpack. <laughs> if we're kayak camping, we'd put all the gear in one kayak and then we put the beer in another one. Uh, <clears throat> 
because you just learn what you can live without. But you don't need to jump straight into that. That's how people die. And you can die if you take a if you take a fall out of a saddle, it will kill you. Um, you need to take that very seriously if you're not willing to do the research, and if you don't take that seriously, you need to keep both your feet on the ground and ask them the story. So, baby babysitting moment, safety moment over, moving on. So we're gonna talk about what's in the dump pouch a little bit. Well, first, let me back up. So I cut all the webbing off and I replaced the buckle, and uh, I cut the adjusters off because the way I sit in the saddle, they just don't do anything for me. I don't need them, um, so I cut them off. So this saddle, uh, I did that. Let me slow down. I put a one inch tube the webbing bridge on it, and then this actually I just started playing with it tonight. I think I'm gonna like it and hunt with it. This is a relatively small change, but this is my buckle that I'm using on my tether is an adjuster, kind of you can think of it as a Roteman or a Prusik substitute if you're more familiar with that. Um, but it's actually built into my saddle and I think I'm really gonna like that. That's different, but I think I'm gonna like it. Um, but everything that you're looking at, the saddle probably weighs a pound. I got another, oh, that was hard. Uh, I got another pound in my lineman's belt and, and my carabiner and my Roteman and everything. That stays daisy chained across the back. We'll just, we'll, we'll put it on. Because it's easier for me to kind of talk to you about it if I got it on. I can get to my gear a little bit easier. Y'all probably tired of looking at my face for a little while anyway. But, uh, let me see. Well, all I'll do is step through it. It's not that hard. Cinch it. Tangle my buckle. And we're good. Alright. That stays nice and tight. I tuck my bridge in so it can't really snag on anything. And then with this buckle, I'm still kind of experimenting with it. I just kind of tuck the tag into where I tag my bridge in like that. That's how I walk in the woods. You can see my daisy chain kind of falls across the rear of the saddle. The bag sits over it. This is, I want to reiterate, this is everything. Once I put this in my pocket, okay, just like that sometimes, I'm ready to hunt up to 30 foot in just about any tree that I encounter in the woods. Any tree that will hold my weight and that I can scramble up, I can hunt. All right. Uh, this is my tubular bridge. Just tied on each side. Good climbing rated knot. My buckle, no leg straps, rubbing when I walk. Before I had them permanently tied, but I kept them loose. Sorry, my camera's going out of focus. Uh, so they didn't really rub. That didn't bother me. I hunted that way for most of this season and all the last season. Uh, but that's how, that's kind of how I walk into the woods. I put that on in the truck, or I put it on in my yard. If I'm hunting out in my backyard, just paddling across the river, I'll put this on in my living room, and I'll just go. When I get to the base of the tree, uh, first thing I do is always unclip my linings, which is just daisy chained. And then I clip in the last loop of it, just like that, my, my daisy chain undoes, and I'm, uh, I'm ready to throw it around a tree and cinch it and start climbing. Uh, when I get done, I just kind of rest it on my shoulder there very quietly. It stays out the mud, keeps the roping from getting dirty. I mean, this rope's just about got memory in it. Just about daisy chains itself. Uh, you can see, that's how quick it is to daisy chain it. Hook in the loop. It stays like that when I'm in the tree. So when I get up the tree, I'll just unhook that, I'll throw it to the side, I've got my backpack on, I hook my rifle into it and drop it down to the side, I'll pull my drill out of my pocket, and I'm ready to start climbing. But once I drill that hole, I've got my dump pouch set up so that my gear is all layered in there. So the stuff on top is the stuff I need first. So I'll drill my first two holes with my easy cut drill, which I've talked about in another video. I drill one knee high, okay? I'll take this out, 
And there's two ways I can do this. This is my carbon fiber bolts. Okay. I can clip them like that to my saddle. Or if I got my back patch on, I can clip them right here. Okay. And they're right there. Easy to take out when I want them. You can see this bolt. So these you can buy them from Rockwest Composites. Rockwest Composites, 3 8 inch, pole truded carbon fiber. It's going to run you a little over $100 to get a set of 15 of them. Um, and I'll, I'll try to go back when I get this video done. I'm not going to edit anything, but I'm going to. I'm gonna review it and make sure I don't do anything too boneheaded, and then I'll uh, I'll post it up. Might have to break it into sections, but I'll have in the sections. I'll try to put the links to where you buy all this stuff. But these are awesome. All of them together don't weigh a pound. It weighs about a pound with the drill, which weighs six ounces. But this is a very light system. This is kind of noisy because I got pine sap on them and I need to clean them. Um, all that this belt is that holds them. This is just an Allen brand cartridge belt like for rifle cartridges and um, you can see they fit in there very nicely they roll up they're separated so they don't touch so I do not coat my bolts I do not have to they are fairly quiet they make a teeny bit of noise but I'm gonna make some noise climbing the tree anyway that's a very acceptable amount of noise that's very lightweight sometimes I'll mix it up and I'll clip it there when I'm walking in. If I'm not going too far through some thick stuff, they ride right there fairly fine. And then they're just there where you want them when you start climbing the tree. Um, as I climb, I do like to have both hands free if I was to need to trim a limb or if I was to move my lineman's belt up a tree. I like to be able to take this easy cut drill with that magnet. That's slick. I'm gonna do that again just so y'all see the second time. All right. If I can drill a hole, jiggy, 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 the hole. I get ready to put my bolt in and move my lineman's belt up a tree. Maybe I cut a little limb or something like that. Just boop, right there. And that stays there. You wouldn't think it would, but that's three Nid, Nia, whatever, rare earth magnets. Um, they're just a wrapped in vet wrap, and there's a little. Uh, strap right there that I think was originally meant to hold a hydration butter tube and it just goes right there it, That's hard to beat and then you want when you want it you just grab it when you don't want it you just stick it right there It's wrapped so if you do it quietly you don't make a lot of noise Or you can just slap it there if it's early season and you're just prepping you slap it Then you can do whatever you want to do hands-free very slick system same thing when you unroll these and you put them right here Everything's where you want it. Ta da! You want a bolt? Put a bolt in. And they don't use it. Like I said, if I do something boneheaded, uh, they don't usually make noise, but they are covered in pine pitch. You can climb a pine tree with an easy cut drill just fine. You're just going to have to clean your bolts when you get done. Um, you can wipe them down with a little acetone or fingernail polish remover to get that pitch off of them. Uh, I've climbed over a dozen pine trees this year because here in Alabama that is the state tree is a pine tree. Uh, our primary export has always been pine trees. Uh, back in the day it used to be like turpentine and stuff like that. Nowadays it's mainly pulp wood. Um, so I've hunted a lot of planted pines in my life. But this whole system, very slick. Um, I'll start drilling. I always start at knee high. I'll drill the first two holes from the ground. I'll drill at knee high. I'll put a bolt in. I'll put my foot up on that bolt. And I'll go knee high on the other side, or just a teeny bit above. And then I just, as I step, wherever that knee is, come across on the other side, that's where I drill. Um, how long does it usually take? I can drill a hole and set a bolt in well under a minute. Um, I can do 30 seconds if I'm hustling, a minute's about average if I'm climbing. I can get two foot per bolt I set. So on an average hunt, hunting 20 to 25 foot off the ground, I set five to seven bolts. You're talking 10 to 15 minutes. I can be up a tree. Is it slower than some methods? Yes, absolutely, but it's very safe. It's very methodical. This is obviously, you cannot beat this for compactness where it is legal. It doesn't make sense to do anything but this. I tried spurs. I did not care for them. Um, 
bought them, used them, sold them. Um, they were very quick up a tree, but they were a pain to take on and off. They were a bit of a pain to carry. And I've talked with way too many people that gaffed out, stabbed themselves in the leg, or, or had some sort of a mishap and just hunting as far back as I do and usually hunting so long, it's just not comfortable with this. Now these, these are, this is generally used in conjunction with grade eight steel. Do your homework because these poultry carbon fiber bolts are not as strong as grade A steel. And if they fail, if you've shot carbon fiber errors, then you know the carbon fiber fails suddenly and without warning. Um, I weigh about 175 to 185 pounds, depending on how long ago it's been since Thanksgiving. Uh, and I feel very comfortable climbing on these. I do not put a lot of weight on them. I don't stomp on them, I step on them. I do not space them out too far because I don't need to. I can drill a hole very quickly and these don't weigh anything. So there's no advantage in cheating and trying to get to the height of eight bolts when you can just use, you know, 10. Uh, it's very safe, it's very methodical. You've got your lineman's belt on. If you were to fall, these are stuck into the tree and that lineman's would actually potentially catch on and snag. I just really like this system. And when you, if you have to come down a tree quickly, that's not an option. Um, if you're using naders and suaders or spurs or SRT or climbing with just a you know, multi-step aider or something like that, you're not getting out of that tree in, in a hurry. If something happens and I need to come down, um, if I'm hurt, if I'm hunting with my father and I get a text that he's hurt and falling out of a tree, um, you know, if you were to, for, for just whatever reason, if you would need to get out of that tree, if you got up in there and found out there's a hornet's nest and they started lighting your up and you need to get out of the tree or if you got a call that you know your mom was in a hospital or something that's always in the back of my mind what if I have to drop this and leave bolt you just shimmy down the tree climbing down doesn't take but just a second you don't even really need your lineman's belt on if it was a life or death emergency you could make it down that tree just fine without the safety of a lineman's belt a lineman's belt helps but it's not necessary um, with the lineman's belt properly used keeping you tight to the tree this is if this was grade eight bolts, I am making a bit of a safety compromise, I think, going with carbon fiber instead of grade eight. But climbing with a drill and grade eight bolts, you're just not gonna break that combo. That's that's about the safest way to hunt mobile. I do firmly believe that. Um, the grade eight bolts are just much stronger than the steps on sticks. Um, you know, the quality control is, is just, it's a lot easier to maintain good quality control over a single component like manufacturing a grade eight bolt versus putting together a piece of tubing with machined, you know, aluminum and then the quality control of your bolts, all that stuff's outsourced overseas, it's slapped together by workers who are paid minimum wage and then it's shipped to you, then you modify it. There's just a lot of variables there that aren't there if you're using grade eight bolts. So I'm a huge bolts fan. If you can't tell. If I'm hunting public land, I do use my wild edge steps. Um, but I honestly, at this point, I, I favor this system so much that I try not to hunt places where it's not legal for me to use these. I strongly recommend everybody at least give these a shot. These, that's a pound. And it ain't much bigger than a Coke can. Um, I usually set, like I said, I usually set between 10 and 12. I got 15 of them, so you figure 15 times two, I can get about 30 foot up in the air. That's as long as the, you know, pull rope on my doors is. So, and and there's no point. I've never really seen a point in getting above 30 foot. 20 is usually fine. Uh, limited situations, 30 is nice. I like having the option to go 30. Um, very quick way up a tree. But anyway, once I climb. And I get.